Hey guys, we're counting them down. We're at number three now in the top five martial arts movie stars of the 1990s that weren't Jean-Claude Van Damme or Steven Seagal. Number three is Jeff Speakman. Jeff Speakman's got some pretty impressive athletic credentials outside of martial arts. He trained and competed as a gymnast during his high school years. He was also a springboard diver. In fact, at John Hersey High School, he was able to achieve All-American status, where he set new records in the conference and district, all without the assistance of a diving coach, no less. As far as his martial arts history and background goes, he was inspired by the cult TV series Kung Fu with David Carradine, which really got him interested in training. During college, Jeff began his martial arts career by earning a black belt in Japanese Goji Ryo Karate from the legendary master Lou Angel in 1980. Upon graduating from college, Mr. Angel told Jeff to move to California to study Kenpo Karate from Master Ed Parker if he ever wanted to make martial arts his life. Lou Angel told Jeff Speakman that Ed Parker was the best martial arts master around and encouraged him to learn from the best. Selling his car to pay for a U-Haul truck, Jeff went off to Los Angeles to follow his dream and fulfill his passion. He actually had a letter of recommendation from Lou Angel, who'd personally known Ed Parker from the late 60s and early 70s. Jeff Speakman found Master Parker in Long Beach, California. He recounts his story and said, Upon finding the master, I bowed very deeply to him to show respect, and I had in him this letter. Parker was so pleased that his old friend Lou Angel had thought to send him one of his own black belt students that I gave Jeff his phone number and told him to call him in two weeks. That got Jeff started in Kempo. In fact, Jeff was invited by Mr. Parker to join only three other people at Mr. Parker's house in Pasadena, California to become what would have known as the last group of protégés. It was also around this time that Jeff Speakman started taking acting classes to hone that craft as well, as he was set out to combine the two. Although he started acting in the 1980s, he had only a few bit parts to show for it. It wouldn't be until years later in 1991 with the release of The Perfect Weapon before he got any real audience attention. The film was pretty successful and a great showcase for his skills. The Strong Start really got the ball rolling into what could have become a very lucrative career. So The Perfect Weapon grossed a very respectable $14 million at the domestic box office, which was a lot more than many others on this top 5 list. To put that in perspective, Jean-Claude Van Damme had double impact in 1991 at the time, one of my favorite Van Damme movies by the way, grossing $30 million domestically, so just over double what the perfect weapon grossed, which makes sense mathematically since we had two Van Dams in that movie. At the same time, Steven Skull had Out for Justice, which grossed nearly $40 million. Interesting note, while promoting Out for Justice on the Arsenio Hall show, Jeff Speakman came up, and here's what Skull had to say about him. How about Jeff Speakman? Nice guy, huh? <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, I was very good friends with his teacher, uh, you know, Ed Park was a, a good friend of mine, and um, he seems like a, a, real good, a real good guy, this kid. I, I've never met him, but he seems like a good kid. There was an interview on the ActionElite.com website in 2015, I'll link the article in the description below, where they asked Jeff Speakman how and why he was cast in The Perfect Weapon. Jeff says, as fate would have it, I was studying regularly at an acting workshop in Burbank called the Creative Actors Workshop. One of the instructors there was also a writer. We became friends. It turns out that he wrote Van Damme's second movie, Kickboxer. Because we became friends and he wrote a martial arts movie, he wanted to come down and watch me teach at the West LA school one night, which he did, and that was his first time to see Ken Po. So, as soon as he saw me, he went to the guy who was the director and producer of three of Van Damme's movies, Bloodsport, Kickboxer, and Death Warrant, and said, You've got to see this guy Speakman, and you've got to see this Ken Po stuff. I've never seen anything like it. After pursuing him and pursuing him and pursuing him, Mark DeSalle finally came to the West LA Dojo and watched me and that was it. When he saw Ken Poe, he realized that this was the next big thing for film. Paramount Pictures wanted a new action star. Universal Pictures had Jean-Claude Van Damme. Warner Brothers had Steven Seagal, two very bankable action stars. With Mark DeSalle on board, Speakman had signed a three-picture deal with Paramount and was looking forward to joining the cinematic ranks of Steven Seagal and Jean-Claude Van Damme. Now, The Perfect Weapon kind of reminds me of Steven Seagal in Above the Law and Jean-Claude Van Damme in Bloodsport, as all those films sort of come across semi-autobiographical. A large portion of the film delves into each hero's background, which sort of introduces the audience to the new martial arts star. Unfortunately, Speakman's journey to the upper echelon of action stardom would be stopped dead in its tracks. After The Perfect Weapon, Paramount actually lost its CEO, who was the one who made a deal with Mark DeSalle, and an interim CEO came in, and that's usually bad news for everybody who signed a multi-picture deal because the studio doesn't want to make another movie star out of somebody that the preceding group try to make out of because the other group will always get the credit. To make matters worse, Speakman got caught in the middle of a dispute between producer Mark DeSalle, who he was under contract with, and Paramount, 
who had a distribution deal with DeSalle through Speakman. Jeff says, The people who came in in the interim were not action movie folks, and they didn't like to sell, but in order to get to sell out, they had to pay him a lot of money just to walk away. So instead of doing that, Speakman and DeSalle actually read a script that Paramount sent to them, with the hopes of making that film. And Speakman says, It was great. It was a great, great script, and it would have been absolutely perfect for my second movie. Speakman goes on to say, We were engaged in it. They had hired a writer for a lot of money, and he was doing a lot of rewrites to make it a Speakman movie. And in the middle of that, the interim head of the studio put that script in turnaround, which is when they take scripts and put them out there for other studios and say, hey, look, we put $200,000 in the script and we don't want it. If you pay $200,000, you can have it. It sort of becomes available. The next day after this guy did that, all of us, my legal guys and my agents, jumped on the phone and called Paramount Pictures and said, what the hell are you doing? This is Speakman's movie. We picked it. You picked it. You gave it to us and... You've already spent $250,000 hiring a writer to make it a Jeff Speakman movie. What the hell are you doing? The guy who was temporarily running the studio realized his mistake and called Fox, the studio that bought it. However, he couldn't get it back. They would not sell it back to him. This script they tried to get back, by the way, ended up being the movie that made Keanu Reeves a huge star. It was Speed, a huge box office success. Mark DeSalle, the businessman he is, continued to hold Jeff Speakman's contract as leverage. You see... DeSalle had the option to do the Speakman movies with Paramount Distributing. Paramount subsequently passed on doing the second Speakman movie, but they would not let him out of the contract because if another studio picked him up and paid off DeSalle and made him a star, then the other studio would get the credit. So Paramount just let him sit on the shelf and dwindle. Since Mark DeSalle had the options for Speakman movies under contract and was not getting along with Paramount, he waited until the very last minute to exercise that option and hastily put together Speakman's second movie, Street Night, which was produced by Canon Films. Speakman recounts, Cannon was able to come up with a certain percentage of the budget for the movie and then the worst of all possible scenarios happened. You're two weeks into filming, everything's going great and the scenes look phenomenal. It's got a beautiful look to it and then the suit starts showing up on set and the rest of the money isn't coming so you have to make these slashes to the budget and then, well it was just a nightmare. For example, a lot of the money goes into the fight scenes. With the perfect weapon, in that movie, there was a taekwondo fight scene. They had one full 12 hour day and another half day. One and a half days. We had 18 hours. Three cameras, three crews, every length and light you can imagine for just the right fight scene that turned out to be two minutes of film. And Speakman had final edit and sound check, which essentially meant he could make sure he looked good and shined, which I'll admit, watching that fight scene, he certainly did. Speakman further recounts, but on a movie like Street Night, when the money gets yanked and you have to try for the same thing in six hours instead of 18, with one camera instead of three, very limited lens package and crew, everything pays a price. And in the editing room, you wind up with less because he had less to work with. That's just the way it goes. Jeff Speakman had the moves, the charisma, the looks. He had sort of a Kurt Russell thing going on. Unfortunately, his career and early buzz gained from the perfect weapon was put into jeopardy because of the rift between Mark DeSalle and Paramount Pictures. Although his film career had a promising start, it's not what will cement his legacy. Rather, his martial arts prowess that afforded him the opportunity to break into film in the first place, is what we'll remember the most about him. He's still currently very active in that world, specifically with his own evolved Kenpo 5.0. Jeff says about founder Ed Parker, I was encumbered by trying to learn from him. When you get an opportunity to learn from a master instructor, you want to pay attention. You want to try the best you can. But I realized that a true martial arts master isn't someone who teaches, but a master is more of a guy who helps you discover the art yourself and then you own it. Ultimately, then you can perhaps contribute to advances in that art, which is exactly what we feel we have done with Kenpo 5.0. Citing some of Ed Parker's last statements about American Kenpo, Speakman decided to make an attempt to integrate ground fighting techniques into Kenpo's self-defense curriculum. Speakman is adamant that in doing this, he is preserving the will of Parker, who always intended Kenpo to continue evolving, much the same way Bruce Lee felt towards Jeet Kune Do. So what do you guys think about Jeff Speakman? Was it just bad luck how the cards ended up playing out because of the rift between Mark DeSalle and Paramount Pictures, and then Paramount Pictures losing the movie Speed to Fox? Do you feel the audiences, both domestic and international, would have taken to him like they have John claude Van Damme and Steven Seagal? Let me know in the comments below.